it would be super easy, I think, to shut this down or to regulate it or to tax it. And it's certainly not as anti-fragile as uh, the, the evangelists uh, like to proclaim. The size of the Bitcoin market cap today should already be powering an economy probably the size of one or two trillion dollars. I've always seen um, the two in this potato sack race uh, against the fiat money system. I'm Stefan Spears. I'm an engineer and executive with McEwen Mining, a New York listed precious metal mining company uh, with exposure to gold, silver, and copper. I spent the majority of my 17 year career uh, involved with precious metals, gold on the investment side uh, and on the mining side. I'm here today in New York with Roy Sabag, uh, my friend of 10 years or so. Um, and we're gonna talk about gold, about Bitcoin, and uh, about the drop gold campaign that's been controversial lately. Roy, good to see you. Good to see you, Stefan. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So, as I mentioned, you know, we've, we've known each other for quite some time now. You've had uh, a very interesting career. Maybe you could start by telling us a bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I've been investing in the capital markets for about 16, 17 years, and I started out uh, being essentially a long short value investor and very quickly transitioned to a specific niche uh, within investing uh, called distressed investing, uh, focusing on bankruptcies and reorgs and spin offs and other event driven type of strategies. And it was through that prism that I really started to become a contrarian uh, almost immediately, noticing that oftentimes a lot of the conventional wisdoms that were uh, uh, proselytized in the market weren't true. And um, very quickly from there, I found myself uh, being uh, very contrarian about the housing uh, market in 2006 and 7, the CMBS market, the subprime market, uh, traded that in the right way, capitalized on it, and discovered gold uh, initially as a portfolio diversifier, but subsequently developed a very strong passion for the precious metals uh, and, and began to actually actively invest in the life cycle of precious metals, everything from exploration to production um, to development. And it was uh, around 2012-13 uh, that I decided to transition from being a portfolio manager to an entrepreneur. Uh, I founded something called BitGold, which was essentially a, a gold-backed digital uh, platform uh, that went on to uh, grow to about one and a half million customers and 1.8 billion uh, Canadian dollars in assets. Today that company is known as Gold Money. Uh, since then I've sort of continued progressing within the gold industry, uh, starting a jewelry brand uh, and doing a lot of other things. Um, but one of the uh, reasons I guess that we're here today is uh, I've also uh, been the founder of a company called BitFarms, uh, which owing to my experience in exploring and mining for gold, uh, availed to me this opportunity of mining for cryptocurrencies very early on. And so um, even today, uh, I'm uh, one of the largest shareholders of this company that is, uh, by our estimations, the largest uh, cryptocurrency miner in Canada and perhaps North America. Interesting. So, uh, you know, the subject matter at hand is, is the drop gold campaign. Around about May 1st, um, there was a, a national ad campaign rolled out by Grayscale's management, ostensibly uh, telling investors to sell their holdings of bullion uh, and to buy Bitcoin through the Bitcoin Trust. In a digital world, gold shouldn't weigh down your portfolio. You see where things are going. Digital currencies like Bitcoin are the future. They're secure, borderless, and unlike gold, they actually have utility. Leave the pack behind. It's time to drop gold. You had a pretty strong and immediate reaction to, to that uh, campaign. So can you tell me why uh, it's different to you than just another asset manager or trust company trying to get market share from another asset class? Yeah, well, it wasn't immediate, actually. I was hoping someone else would do it. Um, but about two months in or a month and a half in, I noticed that there weren't really well-articulated arguments on the other side. And I guess I just want to preface this with, I personally have nothing against Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I, I'm not only exposed to cryptocurrencies rising and Bitcoin specifically rising, but I am actually very sympathetic to the project of cryptocurrencies 
as reorienting a, a society back to sound money principles. So I don't really have a problem with the ethos of Bitcoin uh, or even Bitcoin being a successful project. I guess my issue stems from sort of seeing how these evangelists of Bitcoin um, try, trying to humble us with their piety about, you know, this being the greatest thing ever and uh, rising and, you know, we're in it for the mission and we're in it for, you know, bringing down the fiat monetary system. Uh, all of a sudden, at some point, shifting from attacking the fiat money system as a problem to uh, noticing the sort of $8 trillion of gold, of precious metals, that have been uh, held in exchange and transferred for thousands of years as, as being some kind of a low-hanging fruit funnel into the flow demand of Bitcoin. And to me, that was a red flag that required some sort of response um, because it, it, it sort of feels to me like some kind of a, a Oedipal revolt uh, you know, a, a revolt uh, against the father, where, where gold is the father. Uh, it's very difficult to me from where I sit with the knowledge that I have acquired to see how you could argue that Bitcoin um, not only displaces gold, uh, but succeeds without gold. And to me, I've always seen um, the two in this potato sack race uh, against the fiat money system. So you've you firmly got your feet in both both camps. Um, you know, you're hoping that Bitcoin actually becomes more anti-fragile through through the debate and discourse um, you know that you've initiated. For those that haven't you know read the paper, let's just get a little bit into the nitty gritty of of that. You discuss. You know, the crux of the matter is basically the difference between the natural physics of gold and the mathematical abstraction of Bitcoin. Can you go a little bit more into, into the differences? Yeah, so the way I look at the world uh, in terms of an economy is I, I actually like to use the word, word cooperation, human cooperation. And at the end of the day, um, the reason I think that we're able to make predictions and cooperate is because the laws of nature, laws of physics, whatever you want to call them, are immutable. Uh, uh, they're, they're irreversible and they're immutable, and they never change. And because they never change, we're able to essentially observe, measure, predict, and repeat various activities uh, between each other as we seek to cooperate and achieve prosperity. Now, in that regard, there is a fundamental distinction between the things that are external to my mind, that are corporeal, that I can ingest through my sense perceptions, that I can see, that I can touch, that I can hear, that I can taste, and things that are entirely uh, an abstraction, where I'm employing my memory, the interior of my mind, and perhaps a language like mathematics, to communicate something to me or to you. And where this ultimately manifests is in the relationship between uh, the thermodynamic relationship of energy and entropy. And so what we find is that things that are from the mind, that are abstractions or of memory, uh, generally don't last. They're, they're ideations, they're trends, uh, you know, very academic term, but logical pluralism. Uh, there is no definite truth. Whereas things that are of nature are the, are the lodestars. They're the polaris that allows us to cooperate. They're the sun, so to speak. Now, when it comes to the difference between uh, an element, which is corporeal, and something like Bitcoin, what you essentially have to understand is that the element doesn't need anything other than the laws of physics to exist. Whereas Bitcoin is, a, is an abstraction. It's a system where humans c come together and decide to allocate resources towards the uh, reification of this abstraction so that it continues to perpetuate into the future. If, if humans do not cooperate towards that goal, uh, that abstraction ceases to exist. Where this really comes together is if you consider that the economy uh, has these corporeal elements like Legos, and we take these building blocks and we build modular systems of cooperation to use them. But these building blocks are always fungible and, and, and they can always be moved from different activities that we do. Now, our, our goal when we cooperate is not to just exchange Bitcoins or exchange Legos with each other. It's to, it's to use the Legos to build a resilient, prosperous society. So when you look at something like gold, it's, it's definitely a Lego in the system, but it's a Lego that I can use for different things to do different things. 
I can move it around. It, the, the fact that it's a Lego is based on the laws of physics. With Bitcoin, what I have to do is I have to go somewhere in the corner and take a lot of pieces of Legos just to maintain a new system of Legos to do new things with it. Uh, and, and that's where the fundamental distinction is between the natural order, the natural world, and things that are abstractions. And when it comes to Bitcoin, that distinction has become quite difficult for many people to appreciate because of a combination of the language that's used to describe what's happening with Bitcoin, uh, misnomers such as mining, um, you know, ideas such as forgeably scarce, uh, scarcity, um, and, and I think that where you have to really understand this is that Bitcoin is not being mined, it's being powered into existence. So essentially, all of these resources are being channeled into Bitcoin in a way that perpetuates its own existence. Whereas the gold itself is indeed being mined once, and then once you mine it, it lasts forever. It survives into the future. It doesn't rely on the same miner that mined it in the past. And you know, I'm sure we can, we can get into more, more details about this, but, but this is really what it comes down to. And I, and I find many of the Bitcoin evangelists just have a problem even getting past that point. They, they, they simply don't believe it to be true. Um, but of course, it, it, it is true. It's just an unfortunate fact. And, and I, can, I can quote some more uh, reasons why. Okay, so we can get back to you know, the, the real differences between you know, gold mining and, uh, and Bitcoin mining. Um, in a moment, and I think we should also touch on the, the decay aspect of, of Bitcoin. I think that's a very important topic. Um, first, maybe let's address some of the claims um, that are made in the you know the drop gold campaign. Um, you know that gold is is heavy, that it occupies uh, a lot of space. It doesn't have the value density that Bitcoin because Bitcoin is weightless and and uh, uh, and so forth. I think you've you've proven that those are you know verifiably false. Can you just go through a couple of those and then we'll get into you know decay and yeah, and very quickly. So you know in the advertorial campaign, you see people holding gold, uh, which essentially um, misrepresents the weight of the gold. Now this is very important because those Legos that I mentioned earlier, those corporeal elements, they have. Uh, uh, immutable properties that, that are accessible to us through time that never change. And so we know that of the 90 natural elements uh, that, that, that occur naturally, um, gold has the highest uh, specific gravity, which means that it condenses into a volumetric space and becomes heavier and heavier and heavier relative to everything else. So in the advertorial, you see you know, a guy essentially carrying two bars of gold uh, but those uh, bars of gold would weigh 220 pounds, and you know he's effortlessly walking around with them. That's impossible. No one could actually carry gold that way. Uh, moreover, uh, we're talking about uh, you know 10, 20 million dollars of gold that this person would be holding. So, so the misrepresentation begins by saying it's this shiny metal that's heavy, uh, but in reality. Uh, that value density, the, 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 the amount of energy embodiment that went into producing the gold is why it's worth so much. And in fact, no other piece of Lego in the system could do that. No other, no other corporeal element could store so much energy in such a small amount of volumetric space. So, so that's one. And then when I actually tried to uh, figure out how much volumetric space does Bitcoin take up, uh, I discovered that it takes up an incredible amount of volumetric space when you consider uh, the, the mining rigs, when you consider the transformers, the physical space that's required to actually run these servers that are constantly uh, solving the mathematical puzzles. Um, you know, you end up with a, a difference in ratio of 500 to 5,000 times, depending on how you look at it. And that's when you're comparing all the gold in the world worth $8 trillion to all the Bitcoin in the world today, which is worth about $200 billion. So, so the idea that this Bitcoin that you're using on your smartphone um, has, has no kind of impact or footprint in the physical corporeal world, that it's purely digital, is, is false. It's cognitive dissonance. In fact, it's taking up an incredible amount of energy, uh, physical footprints, resources, and, and ecological opportunity costs because it's requiring a continued investment 
in the reification of this abstraction so that the bits of Bitcoin, which are just symbols, uh, are worth any more or, or act any different than any other bits of symbols that I could just write with my pen and paper. So what are we talking about on a, you know, on a, an annual basis? What does it cost to, to actually run the Bitcoin network? So I was very nice to Bitcoin in this exercise. All I did was calculate the amount of energy, because uh, I always try to think about things thermodynamically. And so if you look at um, the latest hash rate of the network, it's about 65,000 petahashes. Uh, it would require 6,600 uh, megawatts to um, keep that system going. 24-7, uh, that results in about $7.5 billion dollars a year of electricity at wholesale rates. So that's essentially the cost of electricity to society is seven and a half billion dollars. Then you have to look at the mining rigs. Um, it would require about four million mining rigs to run at 65,000 petahashes. So when you calculate the cost of the mining rigs, again, if I, even if I'm being very nice to Bitcoin at $500, $600, um, you're talking about another two or three billion dollars. And the mining rigs have generally lasted for three to four years. So I was extra nice to Bitcoin. I use a six year amortization uh, schedule, depreciation schedule. And in that, in that regard, you're, you're looking at about $10 billion um, before you get into labor costs, rent costs, things like that. So, so that's your decay, that's your theta bleed in option parlance. And, and that $10 billion a year is, is owed to the miners by the owners of the coin. Uh, and so when you look at the coin, even today when it's valued at $13,000, that's about $220 billion of market value. You have a monetary system which is worth $220 billion that's costing about four to 5% a year just to perpetuate its own existence year over year. Uh, that to me is uh, worse than a, you know, any negative yielding, yielding bond because it's, it's telling you that the uh, only way this works long term is for the price to keep rising. But it's also introducing a lot of other arguments that perhaps we can get into that I've, I've reflected on lately uh, with regards to whether Bitcoin is a security. So that's an interesting, uh, an interesting question. You know, how is, how is Bitcoin a security? How isn't it a security? I think that the regulators, I mean, one thing I've noticed in general, like running gold money, and we used to have a cryptocurrency operation that we exited uh, three months ago. Uh, is I think there's this gulf, like a value gap between what's going on in Silicon Valley and perhaps with a few of these companies in the United States like Coinbase and what I'm seeing with regulators all over the world. And I think that, they're, that these companies in the US are presently taking advantage of an arbitrage, a regulatory arbitrage. So for example, everyone believes that the SEC's white paper has set in stone the definition of what cryptocurrencies are securities, uh, especially because one of the SEC uh, commissioners, Clayton, said some things about it. Um, I believe that the jury is still out on this one. I think there's a lot of room for uh, f uh, the Treasury Department, for the Department of Justice, for FinCEN, and even for Congress to step in and reassess those arguments, especially as this thing uh, continues to um, disrupt the economic order. But from where I sit, um, I see regulators at the very early stages of trying to figure out what this is, and at this stage being very unhappy with what they see. It's, it's not compatible with the financial services ethos that have guided um, the financial industry for the last 40 or 50 years, but most specifically after 2008. And I think that some of this is going to get caught up uh, with, with the industry in the next few years. So when it comes down to it being a security, well, if the miners, and, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but when this thing started out, nobody that you would have talked to uh, that was a Bitcoin evangelist or, or proponent, and, and I went back and I looked at my emails and notes, would have thought that at 65,000 petahash, the price of Bitcoin would only be $13,000. In other words, that, that level of decay relative to the nominal value of, of the coins is, is too high. Uh, it, it should have been much higher. 
So, so in a way, something's wrong with the design. Now, because this is the state of affairs, one has to ask themselves, what am I really doing when I'm buying a Bitcoin? Am I really buying something that's immutable? Or am I investing an amount of money to essentially buy an issuance of coins from a miner? Because the miner is literally issuing the coins and then distributing the coins through sale at an exchange. The, the miner can't buy energy from a utility company with Bitcoins. At the end of the day, the, the taxes have to be paid with a fiat currency. So you always have that uh, requirement to convert the Bitcoins. So the miner is mining the coins, selling them through the mechanisms of the exchange, distributing this, this, this thing, this security, this instrument, which is then bought by a purchaser. Well, what is that purchaser buying? If you have a 5% decay rate, which is implicit, it's written into the code, uh, at these prices, well, then the, the, the purchaser is essentially giving the miner a bunch of money up front in the hopes that the miner will keep running the system indefinitely. And I think that at the least, a regulator, it, 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 isn't, it isn't too crazy to, to believe that at some point a regulator may say, well, I have a handful of miners because of this natural monopoly that has developed uh, that essentially control 51% or more of the hash rate. So if they want to, if they're not getting incentivized, the same way an executive isn't getting paid uh, uh, to perform their function, you know, they could, they could argue, they, could, they have the bargaining power in this, in this equation to essentially enforce that at some point in the future, the person that bought a Bitcoin in the past has to pay more. And it could be done through fees, it could be done by literally forking, as we've seen uh, was done by Jihan Wu, the owner of, of uh, Bitmain, uh, with Bitcoin Cash. But if that risk exists, arithmetically, uh, philosophically, I could see regulators coming together and saying, look, even though these miners claim to be decentralized, and by the way, I don't believe anything is decentralized, uh, but, but if, even if these miners believe them, themselves to be decentralized, they're working in Congress in an industry uh, no different than a, a pricing control board. They're incentivized to work together. So in a way, they are an organization. And this organization is issuing these instruments with the intent to make a profit. Now they can either make a profit through uh, fees, salaries, or through appreciation, so the equivalent of like stock options or equity compensation. Well, I at least want them to disclose that when they sell these securities, there are certain risk factors. It's very similar to an insurance scheme or a pension scheme. And one of the realizations that I've had the last few weeks since the drop gold campaign, since I really got down to the, the nitty gritty with this, is I honestly think the regulators missed that. I, I don't think, I think in the first run pass, the regulators didn't realize how mining works and how integral it is to the process. Um, because if the miners don't continue to do this, then the hash power decreases. And if the hash power decreases, we know that it becomes a choke on the ability for the price to increase, the utility of the coin to work, the transaction speeds, everything falls apart. And in the worst case, if we're thinking about tail risks, you can get what you saw with Ethereum uh, cl Classic recently, where you get just a full on 51% attack. Someone comes in and, and mines a bunch of fake blocks and then you've got to fork it again. So, so these are real issues. Um, I, I really believe the regulators have not fully wrapped their mind around it, but when they do, I think that they will ultimately um, decide that the miners are the issuers of the security and that the Bitcoin itself is clearly not this commodity. It's clearly not a currency. It's a security because, because there is a common enterprise here. I'm buying the Bitcoin because someone has made two promises to me. One, that the Bitcoin will be around in 10, 20, 30 years. And two, that if I pay this fee, I will make some sort of a return. And, and I think that I've seen things that are far less complicated than that be regulated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that at 200 billion or so you know, market cap, it's already, you know, it's a significant size currency. Um, it seems to me that, you know, the the on and off rails for uh, you know crypto and, and Bitcoin are fiat, and it seems to me that 
um, the owners of the exchanges and the, and the miners are individuals and they're sovereign. What's the, what's the distributed borderless aspect of, of Bitcoin? Because I don't understand. It's just the regulatory arm. I, I really think a good analog is the file sharing phenomena in the late 90s. And so when I started file sharing when I was a young boy, you know, I used to use Kazaa and I used to use all these systems like Napster. And we've seen that entire industry uh, you know, be, be destroyed. It, it's, it's now a, a legal industry with Spotify and, uh, and Apple Music and things like that. So I, I think especially when you see something like Libra coming now, you really are making a bet with Bitcoin, which is, again, a bet that I like. I like this bet against the system. I would like to see the fiat money system brought down to its core, um, which is why I say it's a potato sack race. But but when you own Bitcoin, the problem here is you can't just buy the Bitcoin, turn it into a bracelet and wait or hold it in your hand. You're, you're still betting on these centralized miners doing what they say they're going to do. So, yeah, I don't really think it's decentralized. And I think it's, it would be very easy. I think if you look at all the nodes, it's like 10,000 nodes. And, and the majority of the nodes are in the United States. And, and just so you know, like the, the block size is 580 gigabytes right now. So we're, that's the block height. So. We're, we're, we're looking at like 10,000 computers that have a hard drive somewhere with 580 gigs on it and probably 12 mining pools or mining companies that control 51%. This would be much easier to control tax, regulate than file sharing, uh, what they did with Napster or any of the other uh, torrent systems. So yeah, it's not, it's not decentralized. I think Nouriel Roubini has actually done a great job of pointing that out to people uh, but, but again, this digital world, uh, young people especially growing up entirely in the service economy in the digital world, they, they don't realize that when they order food from Uber Eats, uh, that food has to be grown somewhere, transported, cold stored, uh, cooked, prepared, physically moved. There's an energy, uh, metabolic energy cost all along the way. And that the service layer at best is uh, communication or information. And that can be important, and there can certainly be secular trends, and moreover, it can even manifest in beautiful ways, unpredictable ways. Uh, but it can never replace the causation, the, the, the chain of causation in terms of what comes first in that Lego edifice, the foundation. And in this case, um, it would be super easy, I think, to shut this down or to regulate it or to tax it. And it's certainly not as anti-fragile as uh, the, the evangelists uh, like to proclaim. So let's assume for the moment that, that Bitcoin survives and, and continues for a number of years into the future. Um, and you know, where, does that, where does that leave gold? You know, gold is, is uh, uh, in my view, completely different uh, substance, you know, a natural element rather than a, uh, uh, an, an abstraction uh, of mathematics. Um, both can have value. We've, we've, we've established that, you know, they, they both perhaps have a legitimate uh, claim against the dominance of, of fiat currency. Um, where do you see gold going in, in the next decade? So this reminds me of one of the tweet battles that I had with Barry Silbert, where he said, I'd like to see, you know, all this $8 trillion of gold be moved into Bitcoin. And I asked Barry, I said, how? And he said, what do you mean how? Cashforgold.com. And again, that's where I realized that there's either some kind of a disconnect where these evangelists don't understand how the economy works, the notion of opportunity cost, the notion of duration, the notion of marginal utility, or they're uh, purposely obfuscating it. But, but what I meant by how was gold, half of that $8 trillion of gold is being adorned. Uh, we've done the research on this. It's, it's trillions of dollars owned by billions of people in the forms of rings and bracelets and necklaces and earrings, uh, in semiconductor chips, in a wide array of applications up in satellites and space. When I say how, I mean, what would you use instead of gold? So let's just take jewelry. The notion of jewelry, uh, contrary to, again, the Bitcoin proponents' straw man arguments, is not something we use to decorate ourselves, to express ourselves. It's something that we use to store human experiences. It's really the original storage media. Uh, we're trying to abstract a memory, uh, a moment in time, a special occasion, 
and wrap it into a physical object that will transcend through time, that we can refer to. So I get married to someone. I want to symbolize the union. I want to objectify it. I want to reify it. I can look at this ring. I can remember my, my wedding date. What we have found through time is that because there's only 90 of these elements, the only one we can really use that doesn't tarnish, doesn't erode, that resists entropy is gold. So the, the three or four trillion dollars of gold jewelry that's owned, it's not owned because the price of gold is going up. It's, it's that elemental attribute which makes it a store of value, the utility that it provides people in terms of this extreme opportunity cost of getting it out of the ground, so it embodies a tremendous amount of energy because it's scarce, but then it lasts forever while everything else diminishes through time and has to be reproduced. So people aren't just going to show up in a long line, billions of people, and convert their gold jewelry to cash, which they will then use to buy Bitcoin, because what will they replace? when they get married, or, or when you know, someone wants to uh, wear, wear a pendant that reflects their religious affinity or something that they enjoy doing, or you know, an engineering. Um, and, and this really strikes back at the heart of why this whole campaign is so poorly conceived in that you've got three, four hundred trillion dollars of fiat denominated assets that can be targeted, and they're sitting there trying to, once again, revolt against the father, attack gold. And so my answer to your question is that gold doesn't really care about any of this. It's going to do just fine. Uh, in fact, it's been having some of its best price performance in dollar terms over the last few weeks since the drop gold campaign. Where I'm more concerned about is Bitcoin's future because Bitcoin is on the one hand trying to align itself with, with the Keynesians or the fiat money system, especially when it starts to attack gold but on the other hand, isn't addressing these fundamental design flaws. And where I'm concerned, I think Peter Schiff has done a really good job uh, at, at, at mentioning this too, because he's got gray hairs, because he's been through the cycles, he's, he's not against Bitcoin for any other reason. He wants to see the fiat money system fail. And I think what Peter Schiff says is, look, when you get some kind of a systemic failure here, uh, very much like an 08 or some Taylor risk that no one's thought about. I mean, think of people are just buying these things they don't know about. It's only been around for 10 years. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. If something goes wrong, well, because these guys tried to align themselves the way they did, the regulators will come in in a far more aggressive way. And once they do, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that there's going to be a lot of issues with price action, uh, with taxation, with all these things. and Because we know that it can't just keep going up with this level of decay. It, it, it's already, if you were to take all the fiat currencies in the world and you were to plot them by the amount of base money that's circulating, Bitcoin's already like top 30. You know, it's like, it's almost as big as South Africa. So how come we're not seeing banking products develop around Bitcoin, payment systems, utility, because the thing itself is too volatile. It, it can't be used. It's, it's, its primary use case is speculation. No one is actually using it to do anything. You can't fractionalize it. You can't hedge it. You can't do anything with it that would permit people to just use it as a unit account, a medium of exchange, or store of value in terms of waking up in the morning and cooperating with each other. It's, it's too crazy. And when you try to just say, well, what are the Bitcoin evangelists telling us to do? Hodl, hold on to dear life. So buy the coin, hold it, never sell it, never worry about how it all works, never worry about what could go wrong, and never use it. Uh, so who's gonna farm? Who's gonna mine? Who's gonna produce energy? Who's gonna distribute electricity? Who's gonna build a service economy? Uh, you, you know, at some point you have to realize that the size of the Bitcoin market cap today should already be powering an economy probably the size of one or two trillion dollars. Uh, it, it's, it's certainly a, a very large base money. But again, once again, if you look at the, at the distribution of the Bitcoins, it's still extremely regressive. So, so you've got 10 or 20,000 people that own most of it, you know, 80, 90 percent of it. So it's, it's not even distributed in a way that would allow its float, its stock, to be uh, referenced every day 
in our daily measurements and toil with each other as we cooperate, the way, say, that gold does, where, where you have billions and billions of people that literally have a stake in gold directly or indirectly. I think that's a very important point um, and one that probably you know, most people wouldn't be able to recall that, that statistic of 5 billion of the 8 billion of stock of gold uh, basically in private hands. And I think, uh, you know, one argument that Barry made in his interview with, uh, with uh, Raul on Real Vision is that you're essentially aligning yourself with central banks if you're an owner of gold because they're the largest, you know, have been the largest buyers of gold recently, um, but they're not the largest owners of gold. So I think that, you know, that's a... Uh, again, another potential abstraction of the whole situation. It's a misunderstanding. I, I really believe the people at Grayscale, including Barry Silbert, don't even understand cryptocurrency mining. I, I don't think that they understand how that whole process works, the lack of diminishing returns, the destruction of capital. Uh, you know, I saw the mining winter in cryptocurrency from March of 2018 till October, December of 2018, where literally mines were shut off and, and, and companies that raised equity capital uh, became defunct and changed their business models. And I think that the idea that gold is rising or falling because of central bank buying uh, or any of these other reasons, it doesn't change what gold is. It doesn't change what gold provides you when you decide to own it, to part with your toil for it. It's a measure and it's a store of value and it's a meritocratic store of value. It incentivizes people to wake up in the morning and, and work towards a goal which makes us cooperate better and makes our entire society more resilient. Actually, Stefan, I'd be interested in your view on uh, the differences between gold and crypto mining since you actually have more experience than I do uh, in the extractive industries, and you, know, you are an executive in New York Stock Exchange listed gold miner. What do you think are the differences here? How, how, do you, how have you approached this thing? When well, I think the, uh, you, know, you talked about exploration, and that's an important point. You know, a lot of, there's essentially two phases in, in mining. You know, first, you need to find the ore body. That's often the most difficult part. You know, only probably one in 5,000 prospects ever become an actual ore body. Um, in mining, a lot of the value that's created actually occurs before any gold is brought out of the ground, right? And I think that's an important distinction because it, that part of the, the success of exploration creates the capital, forms the capital that allows mining to persist. Um, the next phase, of course, is, is you know, getting through the regulatory hurdles and actually raising the capital necessary for this very, very capital intensive business of, of gold mining. Um, and I think that those distinctions and the, and the geographic randomness of, of gold deposits globally um, you know, really gives it a very decentralized look relative to, you know, however many crypto miners are, are and, and also a natural meritocracy. So, so what's the equivalent in cryptocurrency mining of a high-grade mine, uh, a high-grade gold mine or a discovery? There, there is no, I mean, the, the best you can do in crypto is just having lower cost, you know, electricity locating in, you know, Iceland or Quebec where you have subsidized power. Um, Which is once again taking away from from the society's resources. Exactly. I mean, you know, the all of that electricity could be you know put into other productive uses, right? So people have determined that this is um, you know the best use case for that for that power. Or, or what's the equivalent in gold mining? Uh, what is it? Thirty, forty percent of gold mining is still done artisanally by hand. I think that's important because in a lot of uh, you know a lot of countries that perhaps don't have the, the strong fiat currencies that you know exist in the United States and Canada and Europe, um, you know their way of turning their uh, you know incremental effort and toil into savings and wealth is through gold mining, um, and probably 30 or 40 percent is is still mined artisanally. And of course, you know there's a contrast there because it's not you know that's not something that's accessible. You know uh, somebody with no capital in, uh, you know, in a poor country cannot go and start, you know, a crypto mining business. That's just not going to happen. And as happen. we know, they wouldn't even have a return. So, for example, because what we come down to is a return on your metabolic energy. So, you know, I own some gold deposits. Uh, I can think of one that I own in Nevada that has a grade of around eight or nine grams. It's a vein system, a quartz system. You know, you, could, you and I could go out, get a tent, 
get a pickaxe and shovel, go down to the tunnels, find the vein, and sit there for a week. And I mean, it would be a profitable endeavor. We'd eat some food and we'd get some gold out and we could sell the gold or, you know, to someone that needs to use it for something. And there would be our uh, meritocracy, you know, toil. There is no equivalent like that with Bitcoin. You can't, just, you can't just eat food and negotiate with nature and get Bitcoin out of the ground. With Bitcoin, what people are doing is essentially building computers that have to run 24-7 in the hopes that they win a puzzle. And the bigger com the computer they build, with the more power they invest, the more likely they are to win a puzzle. But once the puzzle is won and the coin is sold into the market, the owner of the coin depends on the continued mining of that miner. And so the proof of work that was expended by the miner, the historic metabolic energy, because there's certainly a lot of metabolic energy going into the production of Bitcoin historically, it's not bound to the coin that I'm holding at Coinbase or in my cold wallet. The only thing binding the abstraction to the proof of work is the miner's continued insistence to perpetuate the network into the future. It's, it's the most fundamental difference, and I really implore anyone that's watching this interview that's from the digital technology service economy that hasn't experienced the real natural world, the primary industries, to meditate on what we're saying here. Because this is ultimately where I think there's a gulf. The, the, the difference here is that you don't own something that depends on the laws of physics for it to continue to be the same thing, like gold. And, and you know, at this point, you'll often get um, some of this crazy talk, like, well, what about asteroid mining? Or what about if we discover fusion? And when they bring these nonsensical scientific theories up, they will only focus on what would happen to gold, not realizing that if you, for example, have a deus ex machina source of energy, everything else would become cheaper, including, for example, doing a 51% attack in the hashing algorithm. So everything is, is, is naturally scarce based on those Legos, those, those elements, but that relationship between the elements is fixed through time. And this is, for example, why all these myths about hoarding under a gold standard are false. This is why, for example, deflation under a gold standard is good in the Austrian tradition, where I totally agree with that. But ultimately, what we're talking about here, uh, when Barry says things like that, uh, when Bitcoin proponents talk about um, there's no difference between gold and Bitcoin. And in fact, if you're going to calculate the cost of mining Bitcoin, why don't you calculate all the costs of mining gold, storing gold, transferring gold? No, 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 no. There's a philosophical difference here that you have to appreciate. The gold is mined once, it lasts forever, its blockchain are the laws of physics. And if you want to get into these non sequiturs, suspension of laws of physics, asteroid mining, well, everything would change. I, I assure you gold would still do the best in that equation because of its natural attributes. Absolutely. So it, just to wrap up, Roy, is there anything else that you want to, to mention in the interview? I just want to reiterate that I am extremely passionate about what's going on with cryptocurrency. In fact, I believe that the greatest role cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is playing is in reminding the citizenry why it is that fiat money is flawed and why we have to revert back to a tangible commodity money standard where money has to be an embodiment of energy, of toil, of labor, of time. And I also fully admit that Bitcoin has done a much, much better job at proselytizing that message to the greater population uh, and even in academia and in Washington than gold has. Um, but I really believe, if I have to make one wager, that a few decades from now, when the story is written, the greatest contribution that Bitcoin will have made is accelerating the reversion back to precious metals. Uh, because, because when one of these things goes wrong with the abstraction, everyone that was exposed to this um, and we know that all systems of, of, of formal logic are incomplete. So we know there's this tail risk embedded here. But when this goes wrong, I think people will ultimately say, okay, there's nothing wrong with a tangible commodity money standard, and in fact, appreciate gold's attributes far more. All right, very interesting. Is there a, you know, do you want to perhaps 
point out a chink in, in the armor? You know, how, how could you be wrong, Roy? I could be wrong in many ways. Um, the problem with me being wrong is we're talking about the an annihilation of the fiat money system, the central banking system, the political system as we know it, the banking system as we know it, uh, the IMF, uh, the Basel system, the FATF system. I mean, we're talking about annihilating a hundred years of power structure. And I don't think that war can be won with an abstraction. I, I think that if anything, that war is more likely to emanate from rising powers such as China or Russia or India embracing a gold standard, trading with themselves, and, and, and the West becoming sort of this island uh, of, of services uh, and inflation. I, I don't think that Bitcoin is powerful enough to bring that whole system down. But I may be wrong. It may be that Bitcoin goes from 200 billion to 1 trillion, and then once it's at 1 trillion, it's the top five currency. From there, it hopscotches to 10 trillion. The United States adopts Bitcoin. Uh, all of our banks you know, cease to exist in their current form. Everyone uses Coinbase, uh, and, and that's it. And, and, and at that point, uh, you know, if it goes to one trillion, uh, and we look at the petahash, you know, we just we just all agree to have a currency that's a negative yielding bond. I think we'll have to leave it there, Roy. Thanks for doing this. I hope it uh, engenders the type of debate that uh, that you're seeking in this subject. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Did you know that some of our shows, including the one that you just watched, are available on Real Vision Free? As the name suggests, this is our free channel that is distributed via cable networks, Apple, YouTube, and most importantly, the biggest finance websites. This aggregation means that Real Vision Free is one of the biggest finance channels in the world. In fact, it gets in front of 50 million active traders and investors. And you know what? You can sponsor our shows on Real Vision Free. If you want to put your company on the map, email us at sponsorship at realvision.com.